Satine, why don't you go ahead and try again and see if you're still getting feedback. Looks like it's gone now. All right, so uh, again, uh, thank you so much to everyone for being here today. Uh, as I said, some of you are attending from uh, different time zones. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, where you are right now. And uh, thank you so much for being here. And I wish I could uh, thank each and every one of you individually, but uh, we won't have enough time for that uh, today. Uh, I also want to extend my uh, uh, deepest gratitude to Dr. Engbers and also my committee member, Dr. Uh, Halak Morris uh, and Dr. Rick uh, for their continued support and mentorship uh, throughout this uh, process. It's thanks to their support that we are here today uh, to attend this uh, uh, presentation. So thank you so much to all of you. Uh, this, your presence here means a lot. So without further ado, let me uh, begin by sharing my uh, screen with you all. So my uh, research is about nonprofit accountability. The subsector affect uh, online uh, accountability. So this is the uh, agenda for today. I am first of all going to give uh, uh, an overview of the nonprofit sector in the uh, United States, the importance of the sector in the US economy, and why accountability uh, matters in that sector. And then I will give the purpose for that research. Why did I decide to conduct uh, this research? And I'll also give the theory that I used to conduct the research. And then I will uh, keep move on and give the uh, hypothesis that have been uh, tested. And I will deal with uh, the method that I used to collect my data and to analyze the data collected before providing the results. And those results will be uh, also discussed. And I will conclude with some implications of the, uh, the, the, the research. Uh, so implications regarding uh, practice, implications regarding research, and implications regarding the theory. So, as most of you know, the nonprofit sector plays an essential role in the U.S. economy. Uh, it's known to be the third largest provider of uh, employment in the country. And in 2018, it was estimated that 12.3 million people were employed by uh, nonprofit organizations across the United States. And uh, the sector relies heavily on uh, donations, charitable contributions uh, to operate, uh, individual donors, uh, nonprofit organizations receive donations from individuals, from corporates, uh, from foundations, and they also receive uh, uh, funds uh, like in form of grants from governments at the state or federal level. And it was also estimated in 2018 that uh, the organization, nonprofit organizations received in donation $423.71 billion. So this indicates how people are ready you know, to contribute, to help nonprofit organizations provide the services they are providing to their clients. And the unfortunate fact is that these donations have not always been very well managed by some nonprofit leaders and some nonprofit organizations. We have, for example, uh, the, the case of the uh, executive director of uh, United Way, uh, that at a given point was using the funds of his organization to uh, you know, do his own businesses. We also have the uh, example of the American Red Cross that was found not to uh, manage very well the funds it received after the 9-11 attack in uh, New York City. And it's because of those mismanagement by some nonprofit leaders, by some nonprofit organizations that... Uh, some individuals, some donors, and some watchdog institutions such as uh, GuideStar, uh, Charity, Charitable uh, Navigator, and some regulatory institutions are more and more expecting from nonprofit organizations to display a higher level of uh, accountability, to disclose information online regarding their finances and their performance, and so on and so forth. So jumping into the purpose of this research, uh, this research is uh, to analyze nonprofits' online accountability uh, by subsector, focusing on uh, 
health, education, art and culture, and human services subsector. These are the four main subsector uh, in you know the nonprofit world in the uh, United States. Those four subsectors constitute more than seventy-five percent of the total nonprofit organizations across the uh, the country. So the aim of this organization, uh, this research, is to find out how those subsector differ on the degree of online uh, accountability. So the theory I use to conduct this uh, research is uh, known as the disclosure and uh, dialogue theory. And this was proposed by two scholars, Saxon and Gu. And they are actually the first two scholars that dealt with uh, online accountability in uh, the nonprofit sector. And uh, that theory, as, as you can see, has two different components. The disclosure component, which also has two aspects, financial disclosure and performance disclosure. And the second component of this theory is the dialogue uh, component, which also has two aspects, stakeholder input and interactive uh, engagement. I will come into further details regarding those uh, components of uh, online accountability in my method section. Jumping into the uh, hypothesis, some uh, scholars, Slatten, for example, and her colleague in 2016 conducted a research focusing only on organization in the uh, art and culture subsector. And they came to the conclusion that these organizations do not engage in online accountability unless there is a, a sanction when they fail to do so. Uh, another scholar, Heufer and uh, Twist, conducted a research on another subsector, they focus on human services subsector, and they came to the conclusion that these organizations uh, do not engage that much with the stakeholder in a way to uh, increase the fundraising uh, capacity. So it came to my mind that subsectors might then defer on uh, uh, the, the way they are accountable, they, they behave regarding online accountability. Thus, this first hypothesis, organization subsector, differ in the degree of the online accountability. And uh, a second hypothesis that have, uh, has been tested is regarding a set size. Previous research has found that nonprofit uh, organization, a set size also has a positive effect on their online accountability. Hence, this hypothesis has, uh, as total asset size increases, the level of online accountability increases. Uh, other scholars also dealt with uh, revenue, the effect of an organization revenue on its online accountability, and they came to the conclusion that uh, the revenue also has a positive effect on online accountability. Hence, this hypothesis, as total revenue increases, online accountability increases. Uh, other scholars have also uh, dealt with uh, the effect of personnel size on uh, accountability in the nonprofit sector, and they found that as personnel size increases, online accountability increases, hence this uh, fourth hypothesis. So these are the four uh, different hypotheses that have been uh, tested in this uh, research. Now, how did I uh, collect my data? How did I uh, gather the data and how did I analyze them? So I first downloaded it, uh, the uh, uh, the National Charitable for uh, National Center for Charitable Statistics core file, uh, 2015, and this core file comes with a list of millions of nonprofit organizations across uh, the the uh, United States, with all the information you might need uh, regarding those uh, organizations. And then I proceeded and uh, uh, selected strategically organization only in uh, the state of Indiana because my uh, study is focusing on those two uh, counties in West, uh, South, Southern Indiana, Vanderbilt and Warwick counties. Then I uh, randomly selected organization based on uh, uh, the NTT, the NTEE codes, the uh, National Taxonomy of Exempt Entity, and uh, organization under the A category, letter A, uh, organization in the art and culture subsector, uh, B, under the category B, we have education subsector, uh, E, F, G, and H are uh, health organization, and I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P are organizations in uh, human services subsector. So after all these selection, random selection, 
uh, I had a list of uh, 132 organizations that met the selection criteria. Then I proceeded on again, and uh, through a random number generator, I selected 12 organizations in arts and culture subsector, 11 in education, 14 in health, and 18 in human services. And so I uh, came up with a total of 55 nonprofit organizations, and I did a web content analysis uh, of this organization based on a mixture of variables. And to measure, for example, financial disclosure, I looked into the presence of these uh, four items. Uh, do they uh, provide the annual reports on the website? Do they have the IRS Form 990 on uh, the website? Do they also have the audited financial statement and the administrative costs of funds? For performance disclosure, I looked into the presence of uh, the organization mission. Is it clearly expressed on their website? Do they also describe the purpose? What are they trying to uh, achieve? What are the services they provide to you know, uh, their constituencies? And I also looked into the presence of the outcomes. Do they communicate about the impact they're making uh, in uh, their programs? And for stakeholder input, I looked into the presence of a contact person, uh, the presence of a stakeholder survey, uh, the presence of message forum, and also a presence of uh, a list of staff members. And for interactive engagement, I also looked into the presence of four different items. Do they have a, a link to their Facebook page? Do they have a, a blog? Do they have newsletters? Do they also give the opportunity uh, to their stakeholders to make donations online? And uh, information regarding uh, the asset size and revenue and personnel size were also found on that uh, NCC core file. And to measure uh, total accountability, I computed uh, on SPSS, financial disclosure plus performance disclosure plus stakeholder input plus interactive engagement. And then I proceeded and uh, ran some ANOVA tests, uh, seven of them actually, uh, with uh, subsectors, the four different subsectors being the independent variables. And for the dependent variables, I had asset size, personnel size, total revenue, financial disclosure, performance disclosure, stakeholder input, and interactive engagement. The results for these uh, ANOVA tests uh, were not significant. We didn't have any statistically significant uh, result. And then I uh, ran some regression tests, uh, five of them, and uh, with total accountability, financial disclosure, performance disclosure, stakeholder input, interactive engagement being the independent variables. And for dependent variable, I had uh, asset size, total revenue, personnel size, and I also had some dummy variables, the subsectors, the different subsectors, with health subsector being the uh, excluded group. And I also had the city of Evansville. So this uh, was uh, considered as location, as another dummy variable. And the results of these tests, the, uh, the, the, the regression tests, the first regression was for total accountability. And as you see here, the p-value for asset size being 0.128, this indicates that there is not a statistically significant effect of asset size on uh, nonprofit online accountability. So this contradicts uh, my uh, second hypothesis, according to which asset size has a positive effect on online accountability. For the third hypothesis, the p-value here being 0.051, this indicates that we are more than... Uh, we are 95% confident that there is a statistically significant effect of uh, revenue on online accountability. So this confirms the third hypothesis. And the third hypothesis, the fourth hypothesis uh, regarding personnel size was also uh, confirmed, the p-value being 0 0.098. This indicates that we are 93% confident that there is a statistically significant effect of personnel size on online accountability. And for each addition of an employee in an organization, we have a 0 0.004 increase uh, of total uh, accountability. And uh, regarding location, here we are more than 99.9% .9 confident that there is a statistically significant, uh, significant effect of location uh, on online uh, accountability. 
The second regression was for financial disclosure. And here the model explained 28%, 28% of the variation for financial disclosure. And here we have a, a very interesting results regarding the effect of revenue on financial disclosure. We are more than 99.9% .9 confident that there is a statistically significant effect of uh, uh, total revenue on financial disclosure. And uh, another interesting result is that uh, human services subsector has a positive effect on financial disclosure. And this means that uh, nonprofit organizations in human services subsector are actually more accountable uh, in terms of financial disclosure than organizations in the uh, health subsector. And location, again, has a positive effect on uh, total uh, financial disclosure. And the third regression was per for performance disclosure. And here the model explained 8.3% of the variation for performance disclosure. And the interesting result we got here is that art and culture subsector has a positive effect on performance disclosure. And this means that these organizations are more prone to disclose uh, their performance uh, online uh, as compared to nonprofits in uh, the health subsector. And again, location plays a positive effect on performance disclosure. And the fourth regression was uh, for stakeholder input. And here the model explains 16.3% of the variation for uh, stakeholder input. And the uh, interesting result we got here is that personnel size plays a positive effect on uh, stakeholder input. And here we are 93% uh, 90, confident that there is a statistically significant effect of uh, personnel size on stakeholder input. And uh, location, again, plays a positive effect on stakeholder input. And the last regression that was run was for interactive engagement. And uh, here we have many different interesting results. Uh, for asset size, we see that uh, there is a statistically significant effect of asset size on interactive uh, engagement. We also uh, have personnel size that has a statistically significant effect on uh, interactive engagement. So, and we are 98% uh, confident that personnel size has a positive effect on interactive uh, engagement. And uh, here also, um, art and culture subsector uh, has a positive effect on interactive engagement. And this means that this subsector uh, interacts more with uh, the stakeholders as compared to nonprofit in the health subsector. And again, uh, location, Evansville, uh, plays uh, a, a positive role on interactive engagement as compared to nonprofit organizations that are not in uh, Evansville. So, jumping into my uh, discussion section. Um, so, based on the, uh, the different regressions that were run, uh, we came to the conclusion that nonprofit subsector defer depending on the type of accountability being measured. As you've seen, some nonprofit organizations are more prone to engage in interactive engagement than others. Some are more prone to disclose their financial information online than uh, others. So this is uh, the, 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 the most interesting, I would say, the, the most interesting finding of this research course. It was the main uh, research question. And uh, we also came to the conclusion that asset size has a negative effect on uh, total accountability. And this contradicts previous research. Uh, this is probably due to the fact that in my sample, I actually did not look into, I, I didn't look into organization asset size. They were randomly selected as a set. So maybe if I had considered, you know, uh, organization based on the asset size, I might have come up with a different result. So uh, in, that, in the sample I have, we have some organizations that have uh, millions of assets and others, some of uh, the organization reports zero asset. So this might have played uh, a role in uh, giving us this, uh, this result that contradicts previous research. And uh, the third finding was that total revenue has a positive effect on uh, total accountability. And this means that organizations with uh, you know, higher revenue 
are more prone to engage in uh, online accountability. They are more prone to disclose information online. Uh, I believe this is a way for them to uh, build that confidence with their, their, their donors, with uh, stakeholders, as a way to uh, increase their uh, fundraising uh, capacities. And uh, the fourth hypothesis was also confirmed. Personnel size has a positive effect on uh, total uh, accountability. So nonprofit organizations with larger employees, with a larger number of employees, are more prone to engage in uh, online accountability. You know that when you, you are in an organization with a large number of employees, you have the possibility to have different departments. You may have, for example, a, a human resource department. You may have, a, um, a, let's say, a communication department. And that communication department might be uh, able to communicate, you know, to keep in touch with stakeholders and provide information as uh, people might need those information. And uh, one interesting finding in that study was also that location has a very positive effect on uh, uh, online accountability. And uh, in this sample, uh, I should say that uh, most of the organization were actually located in uh, Evansville, 78% were located in Evansville. This uh, might have also contributed in leading us to getting uh, this uh, result because most of these organizations um, are considered to have uh, to be uh, of the similar size, they're medium sized nonprofit organization with. Uh, similar uh, revenue and so on and so forth. Probably this is why we came up with uh, this uh, finding and this conclusion. Uh, some other interesting finding in this research uh, were that there is a positive effect of uh, arts and culture subsector on uh, total accountability, performance disclosure, and interactive engagement. What this means is that nonprofit organizations in arts and culture subsector are more prone to engage in total accountability in performance disclosure and interactive engagement. Uh, in a nutshell, if you want, arts and culture subsector are more accountable than nonprofit organization in the health subsector. Remember that in my dummy variables, uh, health subsector was the excluded group. Uh, and I, another interesting finding was that there is a positive effect of uh, total revenue on uh, financial disclosure meaning that organizations with higher revenue are the ones that are more prone to engage in financial disclosure. They are the ones who communicate more about their finances online. And as I previously said, this is a way for these organizations to build that trust, to build that relationship, that confidence with their donors and uh, the general public as a way to increase their fundraising uh, capacities. Uh, another interesting finding was that there is a positive effect of human services subsector on financial uh, disclosure. What this means is that nonprofit organization in human services subsector uh, disclose more uh, about their finances online than organization in uh, the health subsector. And there is an explanation to that also. Uh, nonprofit organization in human services uh, actually are the ones that heavily relies, uh, they, they rely on uh, uh, donations, you know, from individuals. They rely on grants from uh, from governments. So they do a lot of fundraising to operate. That's uh, required from them, you know, to uh, disclose some information online if they want to uh, increase, you know, their fundraising capacity and maintain that confidence they already have with their, their, their donors. As compared to uh, health subsector organizations that most of the time operate uh, on uh, uh, an uh, an exchange, exchange, a transaction, uh, exchange transa transaction base, basis. So this means that they sell their services. When you go to a hospital, you pay before you know they take care of you, which is not always the case with uh, human services subsector. Uh, there is also a positive effect of personnel size on stakeholder input and uh, interactive uh, engagement. So uh, these are the two uh, component of the dialogue aspect of online accountability, stakeholder input and interactive engagement. And as I previously mentioned, nonprofit organization with a larger number of people have the possibility to have several departments in the organization and communicate more with the stakeholders. 
So some implications for uh, practice first. Uh, this research has provided strategies for nonprofit professionals to demonstrate transparency and accountability in an efficient and effective way. You know, thanks to uh, you know uh, the uh, internet nowadays, organizations have the possibility to reach out to millions of people around the world. And this is uh, also an opportunity for them to uh, uh, build trust, to maintain, uh, to build relationships and develop, increase their fundraising capacities. So organizations, when they, are, they, they effectively use those online tools, they increase not only their fundraising capacities, but they also build that trust and that relationship with uh, their stakeholders and with the general uh, public. And uh, a second implication for practice was that most of the nonprofit organizations do not disclose important financial documents online. And uh, you know, this is uh, there's there, there's an explanation to that. There there are other platforms for nonprofit organization in the United States to disclose those financial informations online. Uh, we have, for example, uh, GuideStar. This might be the explanation why most of the organization think that it's not necessary for them to engage in uh, that on the website. But it's not everybody that is aware of the uh, existence of you know, uh, a platform called uh, GuideStar. So I think it would be good for nonprofit organizations to also disclose uh, this important information on the website so that when people need information, they can rapidly go on their website and have access to those information. And uh, a third implication is that um, organization in health subsector appear to be the least accountable. And as I said, this is probably due to the fact that they operate on an exchange transaction uh, basis, but they should also consider uh, engaging more in uh, online accountability by providing information online as a way to build that trust with the stakeholders. And for research, uh, many different subsectors exist. Actually, uh, GuideStar uh, listed nine different subsectors. So, for future research, it would be good to deal with most of these subsectors. And this will help us have a better understanding of how those subsectors differ in terms of their online uh, accountability. Future research could also extend the web content analysis by deeply looking into uh, the way organization make use of the social media platform to interact with uh, the public. Because in that research, I actually did not look deeply into the social media, uh, you know, into organization Facebook pages, for example. I just looked into the presence. Do they have a link to their, their, their Facebook page? So for future research, it would be good to look into how they communicate through those social platforms. Because it's not, it's not enough to just have a, a Facebook page when uh, you do not interact with your stakeholders. And for theory, finally, um, improvement is needed on, on the dialogue component of online accountability because this is where most of the nonprofit you know, struggle. They do not interact a lot with the stakeholders. So uh, maybe if uh, organization could have uh, a way to interact, to organize uh, monthly meetings, for example, every month meeting with stakeholders in a way for them to participate in some uh, sort of decision making, that would make them feel valued and feel considered and feel like they are also contributing in the way organizations are being run. And uh, this build that relationship that is highly needed in the nonprofit uh, world. So thank you so much for your uh, attention. This is all for today. And if you have any questions, uh, they are more than welcome. Thank you very much, Fatim. I'm going to encourage Dr. Rick and Dr. Halleck Morris to go ahead and, and open their, uh, un unmute themselves and give them first dibs on questions. Uh, so we'll take a little time for committee questions, and then we'll have an opportunity for others to make questions and comments after that. But thank you. All right. Thank you. Who wants to go first? You can. Okay, one of the first things that I asked myself when I was listening or when I was reading your thesis was, um, I'd really like to know where you got the idea to do this research. Like, why did you pick this research topic? And 
I know this is kind of like a dual question. How will you use the information that you collected in this research um, to help practitioners in the future? All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Halak Morris, for these uh, interesting uh, questions. So, why did I choose to deal with uh, online accountability? With you know a a accountability, uh, as I said. Previous research, previous scholars did not cover online accountability that much. They dealt with uh, some uh, subsectors individually, right? Uh, Slatten mm -hmm. and her colleague, for example, dealt with only art and culture subsector. Uh, Hoefer and Twist dealt with organization in uh, human services subsector. And they uh, came to some conclusion about uh, how those two subsectors uh, behave. Uh, in terms of accountability. So uh, I kind of uh, thought that nonprofit subsectors, there must be a difference between those subsectors. So I thought it was good to investigate and find out how those nonprofits, different subsectors do uh, differ. And uh, yeah, that's mainly why I, I decided to, 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 to deal with uh, that topic. And uh, accountability is also an interesting and important topic for me for, from my, uh, my, my background. I uh, work with uh, different nonprofit organ organizations in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, the Youth Democratic uh, Organization of Burkina Faso, for example, MBDHP, which is, uh, they are all national movements that kind of try and uh, uh, hold you know, public agencies and nonprofit agencies accountable. So I wanted to have a deeper understanding of the notion of accountability and how, uh, you know, we can uh, uh, try and enforce accountability and how to hold, you know, these organizations, public agencies, nonprofit agencies accountable. And this was, uh, you know, uh, a research that could have given me this opportunity. And I uh, confess that I have learned a lot thanks to this research. And uh, regarding your second question on how I will use uh, the uh, data collected, uh, I, I, I haven't talked about it uh, deeply yet with uh, Dr. Engbers, but I think these are very interesting findings that need to be uh, published, and uh, we will probably work on uh, publishing uh, the, the, the finding uh, of this research. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so then I guess I have um, a couple more questions to dive a little deeper. Or, MT, are you done, or is that? No, why don't we take turns, because I've got a couple more, too. Yeah, so. we'll take turns. So I'll, I'll kind of start um, a little bit broader before we get into the nitty-gritty. What was surprising to you in your findings, right? So you did all these tests, and you did all this research. What was surprising to you? Uh, the most surprising fact for me was that uh, my second hypothesis was not confirmed regarding uh, the effect of asset size on uh, uh, accountability. Because through my, my reading, you know, all the, the different articles I've read, most of them kind of uh, came to the conclusion that uh, asset size plays uh, an essential role in online accountability in the nonprofit sec uh, sector. But as I said, uh, this finding was probably due to uh, my sample. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not select organization. I did not look into organization with a certain uh, amount of asset. That is probably why I came uh, to this uh, conclusion. So that's the, that was the, the most surprising thing uh, for me. So kind of like to follow up then, were the organizations that you looked at, are they all locally based or are, were there any that are smaller chapters of larger national organizations? Yeah, uh, yes, some of, some of them are uh, smaller, smaller, how did you uh, formulate it? Smaller organization of national organization. Yeah. yeah, so affiliates, affiliates, I have some affiliates of some national organizations in Evansville. So for like the, so then you were looking at the individual chapter not the national assets. Size. Yes, correct, correct. I was right. looking into, yeah, because uh, as I said, my uh, sample uh, was focused on Southern Indiana. I selected organization only in Vanderburg and Warwick counties. 
So all the organizations were only in uh, Southern Indiana. Yeah, because I also wonder how much of their online accountability then is dictated by the national organization. Um, so I'm a, I'm in a non I'm involved in a nonprofit in town, and we're part of a national organization. And the national organization gives us the website that we populate, and so we have no say in what can or cannot be included on the website. We're just told include this information. And so I'm, I would be curious, right, a future research thing, right, a few down the road, new thing to look at is looking at, you know, how much, you know, expanding that sample size to really see how much of these larger national organizations are shaping um, the smaller chapters, as opposed to just an individual organization that's in, in, in Evansville, versus a smaller chapter of a large organization. I would imagine that would change things. So that might yeah, be a, a yeah, your yeah. thing, to, not now, obviously. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Down the this. road. Okay, thank you, thank you for this uh, suggestion. So I'd like to piggyback on that, because mm -hmm. one of the things that I wrote down while I was listening to your presentation was the idea of a rural-urban divide thinking that urban organizations may have more professionalized staff than smaller rural organizations. And I think that plays nicely with Dr. Rick, with what Dr. Rick said about um, the national versus the local, because I, I believe that there would be another aspect there. I used to work for a small rural nonprofit mm -hmm. and it plays a little differently with yes. than mm -hmm. the national ones. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, and uh, as you've uh, seen in my different results, that's probably also why uh, Evansville was like uh, an interesting predictor of online accountability. Because Evansville, being uh, the largest city in the Evansville metropolitan area, so uh, I assume that organizations here in Evansville have uh, more access to online resources. And they might also have uh, more skilled people to deal with online tools. So that's probably why uh, organizations in Evansville were kind of more accountable than those that were not in Evansville, in smaller uh, localities around Evansville. Okay. Dr. Engbers, do you want to jump in? I'll throw one question in, but he, he's heard a lot of my questions already. But, <laughs> yeah, so I'll say, when Fatim first came to me with this question, th this research topic, the thing that was interesting to me about it is what, I, is, is what I call the charity navigator problem, which is that nonprofit organizations want good charity navigator ratings. And those ratings are, for all practical purposes, based not on how truly accountable they are, but on how much stuff they post on their website. And so I think that Charity Navigator as a oversight agency really drives a lot of this behavior. And so I guess the question that I have for you, Fatin, is, is, is Charity Navigator getting it right? Should this, based on what you found, should we continue to use their standards? Are there other standards that might make more sense? You know, how might your, um, your research inform these um, oversight uh, bodies? Uh, if I, uh, I get you, well, do you mean uh, should nonprofit organization continue to disclose information online as requested, as required by uh, Charity Navigator? Y yes, or, or even more so, is that the best standard? Are, are there other standards that might be better? <clears throat> um, or do you feel like if th that the goal should be to get them to do this, and that if they're doing that, then they will truly be accountable? Yes, I, I would definitely uh, say that it, it would be uh, good for nonprofit organization to keep up, uh, keep on uh, disclosing information online, disclosing the financial information online, uh, because as I said, this is uh, generally uh, the the only way, you know, for larger a larger number of people to have access to those information. Uh, I might be uh, living in Indiana and donating to an organization. Uh, in New York City, right? So I, I, I wouldn't travel from Indiana to New York just to ask uh, for uh, some financial information uh, of an organization. But if those information are provided on the website, I can easily have access to, to these. 
and this might guide me in my decision making uh, when it comes to uh, deciding to support or not uh, a given nonprofit organization. So yeah, most definitely organizations should uh, keep up, uh, keep on providing those uh, information online. But if there is a suggestion, a recommendation I would make uh, regarding the theory I, I, I use, as I said, the dialogue component is when most of the nonprofit organizations uh, struggle. Most of them do not actually engage in uh, uh, stakeholder input, for example, or uh, interactive engagement. So uh, maybe there should be uh, a necessity uh, to revise that aspect of accountability. And as I suggested, uh, organizing, for example, uh, it could be a monthly meeting inviting stakeholders to participate in a monthly meeting in a way to uh, listen to them and uh, uh, take into consideration the suggestion that might more contribute, you know, it might contribute more to uh, meeting uh, the, 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 the theory regarding uh, online accountability in the nonprofit sector. Thank you. You're welcome. So picking back in off of that, this was a question that I had when I first read your prospectus. And I again started to think about the role that a company's reputation would play. Because and I don't know, you've never listed the organizations that you write, but if I have $100 as a donor that I want to donate, am I going to donate to... United Way that I already know a lot about just because I've heard of them, or I'm, am I going to donate them to Urban Seeds, a, a nonprofit that I've probably never even heard of? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder how much reputation plays in the accountability. Um, because on one hand, right, if if there are more reputable people know about them, they probably have a larger asset size, which is right. You already point to in your research, but these smaller organizations, I wonder if the account of, if there's not some link between accountability and the amount of personal donations that they receive. Right. Cause if it's all right. So nonprofits, the goal is to right do whatever their goal is, but another goal is we need money. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder how much of that would influence things. How much a reputation would influence things? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say those organizations are probably reputable because of the good attitude, you know, the good behavior they have had uh, regarding uh, the management of their finances. And they probably communicate uh, about you know, all those information about their financial, about their performance, and people know about that. That might be the reason why uh, people, uh, you know, would not hesitate to donate to those type uh, of organizations. I don't know if I am answering your, your, your question, but this is how I, I, I perceive it. They are reputable because they already engage in uh, financial disclosure, they, uh, they are engaged in performance disclosure and people know that this is a serious organization and if I donate my, uh, my money to, 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 to that organization, it would uh, do its best to uh, meet uh, you know, its mission, to meet the needs of uh, its stakeholder, its, of its constituencies. Yeah, so I'm a critical organizational rhetorician by training and so I look at things and I'm interested in things like power and money mm -hmm. and right. So think organizations like United way, when they have larger personnel and when they have more money, they can devote resources to having a good online presence and a good online accountability. But if you're in a small nonprofit, you right if, you're barely staying afloat, you're not going to devote resources to online accountability, right? You're going to see that as a, oh, that'd be great if we could, but our primary mission is more important. Mm -hmm. And so 
it's just something that I think about. I don't know if you necessarily, I don't think your research can answer it, but I mean, I think it's something to think about of reputation and the power that reputation can have in your ability to have these online accountability resources. And so maybe that can be something that you can play with in your implication section. Um, I just like thinking through it a little bit more. I think that could be an interesting way to um, talk about some of your findings. All right. Thank you. I also think piggybacking on this, on the last two comments, mm -hmm. um, it made me think about the problem of information asymmetry, which is um, Dr. Engbers and I come from two different perspectives, but information asymmetry is something that we talk a lot about in public policy as a governmental failure or a public or a, a failure in general. Um, I'm thinking about Akerlof and the market for lemons, but I'm thinking if we're talking about, this outside organization, the one that um, Dr. Engbers mentioned, the Charity Navigator, they're supposed to be filling in this gap, right, for the problem that the organizations know more than the donors know. And if that instrument is flawed, that perhaps that external source is not a um, great way of determining whether or not an organizational organization is accountable for donors. I'm just thinking if you put in maybe some of that literature in the future, not, not now, but if you were looking at that in the future, you might be able to expand the audience, um, the academic audience for the findings in your research. Okay. Well, and, and I even think that's something that's, that's, I mean, perhaps not in terms of a, of a robust literature review on that area, but certainly, you know, one of the things that we've talked about, Fatin, and we, I think we've got a lot of good stuff here, um, but one theory is, is really kind of, as we make some revisions on this, drilling down on those implications. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great, that, that, you know, what she's describing can be both an implication for theory mm -hmm. uh, and an implication for practice. Uh, and so yeah. that's, that, that might, you might think about how that might incorporate into those areas. Okay. And I'm taking notes too. So you, you, when you, well, you and I can talk through, the, through some of these when we get done. All right. No problem. I also saw that Paula Nuremberg is on this um, Zoom call, and she's in my class and was in my class last semester. And we talked a lot about information asymmetry, so she might have some resources you could use too. All right, no problem. Yeah, she used to be my classmate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to ask, the, uh, I, I try to keep this to about an hour, and I want to make sure the audience has a couple time, time for one or two questions. So I want to ask uh, Dr. Rick, Dr. Halleck Morris, was there anything in particular that you wanted to make sure that we asked with our, in our remaining time? The only other concern I had was the sample size, because I think that the, sam the small sample size is probably influencing some of the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I would probably mention that in a section on challenges in the research, on um, internal reliability, validity, that kind of stuff. But Okay. Yeah, and a similar question of, right, if you had a list of 132 organizations, why did you narrow it down? All right, and that can be in the same limitation section that Dr. Hollick Morris was just talking about. And it's okay to say that this is a master's thesis and you had limited time resources. Just you need to mention why you came up with that 55 number. Yeah. Okay. All right. And in his defense, I'll tell you, some of that is because I wanted him to finish, and so I told him not to do all 136 of them. Oh, a good thesis is a done thesis. <laughs> Definitely. All right, any other, uh, we've got time for one or two questions from, from, from those of you who have come to join us today. Uh, I wanna give people an opportunity to ask if they're interested. If you could just kind of unmute yourself, ask your question, and then remute yourself, and we'll go uh, to try and keep the feedback down. Not so much of a question, but uh, just to say this was a great presentation. Uh, a lot of insight to tech and probably I'll follow up for more information, Fatim. Thank you. Thank you, Joel Chiti.
Platine, this is Bonnie. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. I have a question. All right. How do you think this research and what you've been doing at the university is going to inform your work in Burkina Faso when you return? Um, yeah, well, uh, as I said, uh, I am already uh, engaged with uh, different nonprofit organizations uh, back home. And uh, these organizations, uh, this research has given me a lot of insight, a lot of uh, information that would uh, help me uh, better, you know, uh, orient or guide organizations on how uh, they could be accountable towards their, their, their stakeholders and, uh, uh, you know, communicate toward the, the stakeholder, build good relationship in a way to uh, build that trust and confidence and also increase their fundraising uh, capacities. Does that answer your question, Bunny? Yes, thank you. And you know, we're involved in a nonprofit together, Fatim, and we could certainly use a little expertise. All right. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll do it for free. <laughs> it, yeah, they can't beat that. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, not seeing any other questions, let me thank everyone for coming. Let me congratulate uh, Fatim on a great presentation. Um, if, if you are a, a, a he just here to, to support Fatin and cheer him on. I'm going to let you get ahead and log yourself out of the session. Uh, and then Dr. Rick and Dr. Halleck Morris, I will put us into a breakout room to kind of talk through some things. And Fatin, we'll be back. Just hang tight. You can fix yourself a sandwich or go to the restroom, and we'll be back uh, in a moment. All right. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you.